No Daily City police officers or patrol cars appear in this film. I hope you will watch the whole story, which takes place in the early 1970s, when film was cheap and the need to make movies could be a dangerous combination. This is the story of just about the craziest movie a kid of 12 or 13 could ever make, and one of the worst disasters. There had to have been other kid directors who had their films stopped by the cops. I can imagine some of those reasons being trespassing, explosives, car chases, concern over hearing an actor screaming, and a myriad of other things that would have drawn attention. But ultimately, probably no one was so stupid as to make a realistic sniper movie in broad daylight with dozens of possible witnesses, all the while not understanding that what we were doing with a rifle and blanks could call attention to ourselves. To put it mildly, the best laid plans of kids with cameras can go so wrong. Since you probably want to skip ahead and see the film, I'll show it to you now in its raw glory, and then I'll discuss the lead up to making it, the day of the shoot, and what the dire consequences were. I'll show it again and talk our way through it, but it's very short. Keep in mind, this was made 50 years ago, and not only was the camera very basic with low-end automatic exposure ability, which shifts around in the light, but the film itself, which I've scanned frame by frame, is now slowly losing its original color saturation and detail. The location is Daly City, California, just south of San Francisco, near Saramonte Shopping Center and the 280 freeway, where it divides to go to Pacifica. The film ends abruptly, and that's because, in the midst of filming, all hell broke loose. Here is the basic Super 8 film, which begins on a roof with a figure with a rifle, two cops on their lunch break, and three boys playing catch. And then it stops, which I'll get into, but let's start at the beginning. How I got the idea for the script, which was a silent film with plans to later add sounds to a cassette tape, I believe came from a mixture of real events and fictional movies. As to my youthful background, I grew up liking cars, trains, toys, horror movies, cartoons, comics, monster magazines, drawing, amusement parks, action movies, gum cards, Pez candy containers, and TV shows. Lots of TV shows. Looking back, I liked Batman and the Green Hornet and all that, but I developed a special affinity for cop shows. I admired kid actors too, and wanted to be on a TV show like Danny Bonaduce in The Partridge Family. As I grew up, I was allowed to see movies, sometimes without parents, in the theaters like Bullet, 2001 A Space Odyssey, Dirty Harry, Straw Dogs, The French Connection, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, M.A.S.H., Clute, Little Big Man, Soylent Green, The Omega Man, Bless the Beasts and Children, Planet of the Apes, The Cowboys, 
As an aside, Bruce Dern was one of the greatest and scariest villains ever, so it was nice to see another side of him in silent running. I don't mean to go on, but I love the movies, including That's Entertainment, because I love the music in it and the stars I didn't grow up with, such as Gene Kelly, Fred Astaire, Sid Charisse, Judy Garland, etc. And then there was James Bond, and that was very big, of course, and near and dear to our family. Heck, we even saw some weird drive-in type movies, and by way of contrast, nearly all the major Disney films as well. But based on some of the other titles, you might wonder how I got into R-rated movies when I was only 12 or 13 years old that in some cases my parents didn't see. Well, all I can say is my mom would sometimes drop me and my friend off at a movie theater and from the car wave to the ticket booth person signaling that it was okay to let us in. And that was all that was needed. Richard was my best friend and we had our junior high literary likes too. Charles Adams, Mad Magazine, and Mad Paperbacks. And the height of all print media, famous monsters of Filmland. But I think before junior high, I started making movies with the family Super 8 camera. The first may have been a fight between action figures Johnny West and Chief Cherokee. Another was an experiment with clay on the kitchen table for a movie called The Blob, but the film was completely overexposed due to the bright lights and indoor film I tried. Later, with the help of my younger brother Billy, I made a semi-animated car chase movie using motorific track and corgi cars, some comedy skits, and then a spy action film using G.I. Joes. Somewhere during this time, I remember seeing a short film that a fan sent into Creature Features that Bob Wilkins showed on the air, and I was super impressed by it. I began to dream of making my own short films with people, not just simple animation. I drew out a storyboard script called The Terror on the Tricycle, inspired by the short I had seen on Creature Features, and I really obsessed about making it, but ultimately the Sniper movie would be my first live-action drama. As an aside, I'll mention my younger brother took over the animated film department and went on to spend his own junior high and high school years making G.I. Joe spy movies, as well as others, and that could be a documentary unto itself someday. Now as to the exact year I made the Sniper movie, I'm not sure. It was probably during 8th grade in 1972 or 73. Across the street from Richard's house, there were two things that we needed. One, we found out our old friend Nicky from Daniel Webster Elementary School had a rifle and blanks. I knew the difference between real bullets and blanks too, so those were cleared on the day of the shoot. The rifle was a 22 and even had a scope, shades of the rifle found in the Dallas Book Depository building. Since Nicky had the rifle, he would play the sniper. A military-style hat was helpful, and he had that too. And then across the other street and up the block, there was a building called the Cerro Gardens convalescent hospital. It had a detached and enclosed stairway that led to the roof. More importantly, they didn't lock the ground floor door from the outside, or it did not have a door, and somehow out of curiosity Richard and I had gone up on the roof before. The other thing was that Richard's dad was a police officer, but not in Daly City. Some of his gear was at home, so Richard was able to borrow one of his father's hats. Richard would play the cop on lunch break with a partner, and my brother and two other boys played kids passing a baseball back and forth. Here again is the Sniper movie, at least as far as I was able to film it up until all hell broke loose. First we have the Sniper. He's up on the roof, scanning the ground for victims. But he's not obvious, so Richard and the other cop taking a break don't notice him.
And then there are the boys playing some form of catch and monkey in the middle. The ball gets missed and one kid runs after it. At this point, the sniper locates the two boys and shoots them. They grab their chests and blood spurts out from specially concealed blood packs. I wanted the packs, quote unquote, hidden under the clothes to break when they hit them with their hands, but failing that, we attached strings to pull the packs open. I remember when the film's colors weren't faded that there was a spurt that actually looked good. So far, I was getting through my shot list and it was on to the next when... At this point, I stopped filming because I began to hear something with growing intensity that I had never heard before. For some reason, I knew almost immediately what it meant and I was scared. The occasional police or fire siren was not that unusual in Daly City, especially in the summer due to dry grass fires. But when I heard first one siren, then another, and another, and another, it seemed like there were more and more from every conceivable direction, and they were all heading directly toward my position. Before I could even say anything to the other kids, we saw one police car after another with lights and sirens blaring come speeding around the corners, even on two wheels, all of which passed me standing there with my camera on the tripod and then skidded to a stop at the outside stairs to the rest home. The cops jumped out of their cars with guns drawn and ran up the stairs. As this was happening, another police car stopped in front of me and a seasoned looking officer yelled, Hey, you kids, get out of here. There's a man on the roof with a gun. I said to him, and I felt very bad about it, so I said it apologetically, We're making a movie. He looked at me in shock, and then he swore at me, which I admit stung, but who could blame him for that? He probably rolled up on some strange situations in his time, but like that line in Saving Private Ryan, the world had taken a turn for the surreal. Or if not surreal, then just dim-witted and irresponsible. Then he drove on and stopped near the other cars. Let me state emphatically that I was sorry about it as soon as it happened, and I herewith apologize to the entire Daly City Police Department, past and present. As director, it was my fault. I just didn't think that anyone would notice us, and at the time, I was shocked that they did. I don't know who made the call, nor if they even mentioned that it looked like some kids with a camera were making a movie. The camera was small and they may not have seen it. All they may have said over the phone was that he or she saw some kids getting shot by a sniper. And with that, the police were headed to one of the most dramatic calls they ever had. You have to remember even the Zodiac, a couple of years earlier in nearby San Francisco, in one of his letters, had threatened to shoot kids exiting a school bus. But I want to say this in case you think I was 100% out of my mind not realizing that the police could be called while we were making the movie. You have to understand that I grew up in an era when, in my city, hundreds of kids ran around and played outside. And a favorite pastime of boys and some girls was to play with toy guns, many of which were realistic looking. Here's a photo from my 8th birthday party, and that's a toy machine gun someone there gave to me. The dark camo coloring is a little odd, but otherwise you could say it has a realistic appearance. Here's a picture of a western gun my older brother received on his 10th birthday. And more importantly, since I'm painting a picture of how it was, many of the toy guns of the era were cap guns. Cap guns were loud, and like many a boy, I loved caps and cap guns. Most caps came on a roll, while others could be stuck to toy bullets or one-shot cap guns like pirate pistols and Civil War rifles. Bang! 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 You literally could see and hear boys and girls 
playing outside on any given block with cap guns and pointing the guns at each other and sometimes even pointing at cars driving by. Sometimes we even unrolled the caps on the sidewalks and hit them with a hammer or doubled them over for an even louder bang, which I remember stinging my ears, or cut out the gunpowder in an attempt to make homemade firecrackers. So while vision of suburban kids playing with realistic and loudly firing cap guns may seem difficult to picture today, for those of us growing up in that era, we thought nothing of it. And really, neither did the occasional city police officer who might drive by and see it for themselves. So in terms of my sniper movie, that may have fed into my thinking that a couple of blanks would not have drawn the type of attention that it did. But back to our story. All I can say is, thank goodness, Nikki didn't get confused and point the rifle in the direction of the cops when they ran up on the roof. They may have shot him. I did not see what he did up there, but he probably put the rifle down and flattened out when he saw all those uniformed officers with guns coming for him. As these events unfolded, I next noticed Nikki's mom running out of her house toward the police. She was yelling something frantically. They brought Nikki down from the roof and he stood there with his very distraught mother talking to the interviewing officers. Now you may be wondering, who was in trouble the most? Me? Or Nikki? Or all seven of us? Well in those days if you got in trouble with the Daly City Police and they didn't need to arrest you because they could hand you over to a parent, they would fill out a white incident card with your name and address and then that was kept on file at headquarters. And I have no doubt they had many white cards. And since Nicky used his rifle and discharged it in the city limits with blanks, he was the one in trouble and he had the white card filled out on him. Then he was allowed to go home in the custody of his mother. They probably even gave her the rifle back, but I don't remember. As for me, they didn't even question me or lecture me or tell me to go home and don't do that again or call my parents. Yes, a senior officer had sworn at me, but once they saw we were just some kids making a movie using bad judgment, we all just walked away. It seemed it was all over pretty quickly and they got back in their cars and left. Nicky was sent home and we needed him for the final scene when the actor police were supposed to run up on the building and shoot him. I had it all planned for Richard's big moment, the son of a real cop that I knew and looked up to playing the hero. I thought too we could make a dummy by stuffing Nicky's clothes and then I could have filmed it falling off the roof, but that was it. I was too shook up to try and work around what happened and try to finish it, nor did I want to go near that building again. I don't even remember if we talked about it. We all just went home. Believe me, unless you've heard every police siren in your city go off in quick succession with the sounds heading directly to where you are standing, it's a feeling and an experience that is so many things that it's almost too big to even comprehend, like being in a slow motion plane crash and you can't believe it's happening. Of course you are probably wondering why I didn't just film the speeding police cars as they arrived and used the footage in my movie. Honestly, I was afraid to film it. I didn't want my parents to know what happened and I didn't want to get in trouble, which I would have if they ever saw those police cars like I had in a money can't buy point of view shot. And the thing was, if I remember correctly, I had told my mother about my plans for the film and she asked if I had permission to use the roof. Well that depended on what the definition of permission was, given that the door was left unlocked for anyone to go up on the roof any time they wanted, or again, there was no door. I don't think there were signs posted either because it probably never occurred to them that anyone would want to use the back stairs to go up on the roof. So in a sense, one didn't need permission. 
Perhaps with that in mind, and not wanting to complicate things, I told her that I did. But being I knew my mother had meant something more official than what I meant, she could say I lied to her, so I didn't want her to know what happened. After the film was developed, she watched it and asked me why I didn't finish it, and I said something casual like, Oh, I don't know, I couldn't get the kids back together again. She never mentioned if she heard the sirens. Richard's mother wasn't home down at the corner house or she would have come running out just like Nikki's mom. The one little problem was my brother, star shooting victim. Would he keep the secret? I found out some time later that he did not. After about two months, he couldn't contain it anymore and so ratted me out to our mother. If hearing and seeing the police speed to our location made a big impact on me, imagine the impact with an even younger boy. It must have been even more mind-blowing to him and the others, except they didn't bear responsibility like I did. In any case, my brother and mother kept it as their little secret for quite a while until my mother finally told me he had told her. But since some time had passed, she wasn't mad. I don't think she grasped the seriousness of what could have happened though. First of all, a police vehicle could have got into a serious accident since they were flooring it to the location. And second, one or more officers could have shot Nikki. And third, one of the old folks in the building could have had a heart attack. But fortunately, because of the professionalism of the Daly City Police Department, they handled everything with more than flying colors. You might say maybe it provided some excitement in a city that probably never had a call like that before, nor I hope since. But then any call with someone shooting from a roof in the pre to early SWAT days was probably not on any officer's wish list. What I did was not intentionally wrong, but that made no difference and it left a lasting impact on me. I basically gave up live action films at the time and felt like it would be a whole lot safer to be in drama instead. So as the school year wound down, and that's again if my timing of the events is correct, Richard and I were approached by Mr. Resnick at Ben Franklin Junior High to be in the 8th grade class musical called A Real Live Murder. Mr. Resnick told my parents that he thought I was one of the funniest kids he had ever met. And it's true, I was really a goofball, but my humor was not necessarily appreciated by other kids. I didn't have much going for me scholastically either, so drama was an area I would plug into at Westmore High School the next year. Richard went to Reardon in San Francisco, so we ultimately lost track of each other, but I did go to see him in his freshman play, West Side Story. He was one of the Jets, and I thought he and the cast did a great job. All I can say is, if you want to make a cop movie, or a zombie movie, or what have you, either let the police know what you are doing, or be so far out in the boonies that no one will see you or mistake your movie for reality. And even then, you can't be sure someone might not come along and make an alarming phone call to the police. That's the moral of the story. The police don't want to stop kids from having fun, but you should know anything having to do with firearms, real or fake, can result with terrible, unintended consequences which you should seriously try to avoid. And in light of the tragedy that occurred on the Rust set, every guerrilla filmmaker as well as studio filmmakers are now reconsidering the whole issue of firing blanks in the first place. In fairness, the vast majority of time it has not been a problem, but still for safety's sake every independent filmmaker should be sure to proceed with each effect and stunt with extra caution. I apologize to the cast and the neighborhood because I don't know how it affected anyone else. Well, I know Nikki's mom was upset, and once again, my apologies to the Daly City Police Department for that day and the trouble and danger it caused. I'm glad nothing happened and in the process, I not only realized I was probably better off 
not making sniper movies, but my friends and I heard and saw something that was not just a nightmare, but also something that leaves me with some extra pride in my city's police department. For whatever the call was that they received that day, they got there faster than you can imagine. No one got hurt, and they could not have handled it any better. For all that, a frightened young boy with a movie camera from 50 years ago salutes you.